Hey, this is Inam. I am a machine learning engineer. And today we will try to learn about the transformer model in the attention is all you need paper. Here the model follows the encoder decoder card architectures, but instead of using a recurrent network or convolutional layers, it uses the attention mechanism. Uh, who cares? It's wrong. Uh, if you are searching for this type of video on YouTube, Chan is that you are a beginner who doesn't even understand what attention is. Let's do a bottom up approach. So different from other video, we will start from the face basic and the fundamental first and slowly build up instead of jumping directly into the transformer model. Because to be honest, the whole thing looks ridiculously complicated for beginners. But if you understand the basic and the fundamental part of the basic blocks, you can reconstruct the whole thing yourself from scratch. This is from my perspective and understanding, so if you see any inconsistencies compared to the paper, then the paper is wrong and correct. What is attention? So from a very like bare-bone or very old perspective, you can think of attention as a pooling method, similar to say some pooling, mass pooling, or average pooling, where you have like multiple items and you want to combine them into a single output or a single item. Pooling is usually used in two ways. The first one is fusion, where you want to merge multiple features or multiple items into one. And the second one is where you have uh, multiple items and you want them to absorb information from each other. Examples for these two uses are like the 2D global average pooling in modern image model, or you can also do global pooling 1D in sequence data such as test or videos. Or if you are doing multimodal kind of tasks, you can use pooling to fuse multiple features into one. Example for the second use is say the 2D max pooling in old image model where you kind of sliding uh, a small window size, corner size at its spatial location and perform the local max pooling at those windows. So basically the output item is still the features at that location but it kind of absorbs also the features in from the neighborhood in that window location as well. Attention uh, is actually a special pooling operation. It is a weighted average operation. Let's say you have the input which is a set of items uh, i1, i2 and i3. Here we will need an additional input, the weight of each item. We're going to call it w1, 2 and 3. Then attention is calculated as w1 multiplied with i1 plus w2, i2 plus w3, i3. So it basically the weighted sum of the input items where the weights are positive and they sum to 1. So the weights are a property mass distribution. So that's why I call it the weighted average. And you can think of W as the attention of each item. So where are W from? Uh, they must be property mass distribution. So they are come from like a output of a softmax. They usually function of the input itself, I1, I2, I3. Uh, in this case, people usually call it self-attention. Uh, they can also be a function of extra input where you want to fuse new information into uh, your model. With that being said, for different papers or projects, people might propose different approaches to compute these attention weights. Alright, the next question is how is this uh, specifically done in the attention is all you need paper? They are doing something that uh, I will call the query key value attention mechanism. Supposedly, the input is a set of three items, I1, I2, and I3. To perform attention pooling, we need uh, two things. The first one is the three input features, which we can use the three items directly, but here we will use a linear transform version of them, which we will call the value 1, V2, V3. The second thing that we need is the weight, V1, 2, and 3, and then we can perform weighted average to produce the output. The weight can be the function of I1, I2, and I3, for example, However, a single output is not what we want. We actually want three outputs corresponding to three of our items. Let's say they are 01, 02, and 03. Meaning here we are not doing fusion too much multiple items into one. What we are doing is that we want to absorb the extra information. We want each item in the input to absorb the information from each other. For example, 01 should correspond to I1 but also absorb some information from I2 and I3. This is done as following. For each item, we perform a transformation to produce 
a key for each item. So we have K1, K2, and K3. Now say if we want to compute the output O1, we apply another transformation to compute a query value for I1. Let's call it the Q1. And then we will match the Q1 to all the keys of all the items to compute the corresponding weight. We will match Q1 and K1 to produce W11, and Q1 and K2 to produce W12, and Q1 and K3 to produce W13. The matching between key and query is done using a compatibility function. In this case, the dot product function. The dot product produced higher value if the input features are similar to each other. You can replace it with similar kind of function, but dot product is very efficient. Then, using these ways, we perform weighted average on V1, V2, V3, and the output is O1, corresponding to the item I1. The other outputs are computed similarly. Uh, for O2, first we transform the I2 to the query Q2, and then we match Q2 with K1, K2, K3 to produce W21, W22, and W23. Then we're using these ways to perform weighted average and output O2. Similarly, we can produce O3. While looking complex, most of the operations are just multiplication and then summing. They are most of the time invented as an uh, efficient matrix multiplication operation. You can view W as the cell tension matrix, where the weight of U I J is how much the item I attends to item J. Let's fill in two missing details. First, the weights had to be property mass distribution, so we need to include a softmax layer after the compatibility function. Secondly, we need to include a scaling layer before softmax, because softmax couldn't produce root gradient if the input value is too extreme. This usually is not a problem if the score is output of a normalization layer or a fully connected layer, because the layer is cleverly initialized in such a way that its output will usually follow the standard normal distribution or something like that. In our case, the scores come from the dot product function between two vectors, and its value can become extreme if the size of the vectors are too big. That's why we scale it down. In the paper, they found that it's beneficial to perform this attention multiple times, because why not? And then we can concatenate all the outputs and perform a linear transformation to produce the final output. This entire block is referred to as the multi-headed attention. The input is a set of items, and this item will attend to each other. The final output is a new set of items. This is how it is illustrated in the paper. Given that our next task will be to build a basic building block for the transformer. Given the input I, we first put it through the multi-headed attention described earlier. You might think let's stack multiple of them to make it more powerful. But there is a problem with that. This attention model is ultimately just a weighted average operation. The output is still kind of linear transformation of the input. So we add a feedforward module after that, which basically just say a fully protect layer and a ReLU layer, introducing nonlinear transformation. So that this block now has more capacities. Finally, it's hard to train a very deep network without normalization and residual connection. All modern networks requires them to train well, so we are adding them too. And thus, we finished the transformer basing block and this is how it is illustrated in the paper. Up until now, I have not mentioned sequence to sequence or even natural language processing. Note that this is a generic processing block that you can throw in any networks or any tasks. But now we're going to use it to build something, something simple first, a sequence encoder. It can be useful for, say, to encode and classify some text. We will not invent a new model or anything, we'll just reuse an existing model and just plug in our processing block. For example, you have an input sentence, nam, love, dog. After tokenize and embed the words, we use a recurrent neural network to encode it. We can stack multiple INN layer. The last output will be the encoding of the input. Applying the same scheme, you can treat these embedding words at a set of items and we can use our transformer basic building block we can stack multiple of them and we treat the final output as the encoded this model will work but suboptimally because the sequential information is lost nam loves dog will be the same as dogs love nam is the bag of words because if you recall our 
basic building block will treat the input as a set of items. There's no ordering. The solution is to embed the structure information into the items themselves. For example, I can augment the embedding of the first word and put a value 0, 1 for the second word and 2 for the third word. This way, the same words will have different embeddings depending on the sentence structure. In the paper, this process is called positional embedding. Now I only use 0, 1, 2 as symbol illustrations, but we will want to use more sophisticated uh, embedding schemes. For example, we can have a learnable embedding vector for each position. The papers also show that using sine and cosine functions of different frequencies is also very effective. I will defer you guys to reading those details in the paper. And that's it. all you need to do to build a sequence encoder. You can apply this model for sequence text classification kind of task such as sentiment analysis. This is how the model is illustrated in the paper. Next, let's apply our basic building block for something else. This time, we will build a sequence text generator. This model will be useful for tasks such as uh, to synthesize text, speech, music. After that, we can combine our sequence encoder and sequence generator to build a sequence to sequence model. This model will be useful for some interesting tasks such as translation, chatbot, Q&A. The most common sequence generator approach these days is to generate one item in the sequence at a time. Let's say the recurrent model, where first you input the star token, and it will generate the first word in the sentence, and then you can refeed that word as the input to the model again, and it will generate the second word, and you repeat that process until it generates the nth token and you have a complete sequence, in this case, noun, love, dog. So it's basically a generative model where it takes the input of an ongoing sentence and it will try to predict what the next word is in that sentence. We will apply the same structure. Instead of using the recurrent network, we will use our transformer basic building blocks because we can stack them to make them more powerful. However, we cannot use it as is like in the case of an encoder. We need to make some modifications. Let me explain why. The way we train this kind of model is that we fit it the whole sentence. In this case being a sequence of words, the output is also a sequence which we want to be the prediction of the next word. So we will use the next words as our label for learning. The last function will compare the output with the label and generate gradients for us to train our model. Let's say Nam loves dog is our training example. At the position of the word loves, we want to predict the next word, which is logs. The problem is that the generation process is one word at a time, from left to right. So the position of the word love can see num, but cannot see the word dogs. But our attention mechanism is that any word can attend to any other word input. So from the sequential temporal perspective, it is cheating. It is predicting the future by looking at the future directly. The solution is that we have to limit attention to the past or to the left only. This means that if we are at the word loves and try to predict dogs, we can only see the token start and num, and we cannot see dogs and end. For this to happen, we need to go back and adjust the query key value attention part described earlier. Here it is. Let's say now our input i1, i2, i3 is a sequence. Let's look at i2. At this position, we cannot see i3. So we have to force w23 to be 0. The paper does this by adding a masking layer that sets some score to negative infinity. The goal is to make wij0 if i is smaller than j. Once this modification is made, we can train our model and use it to generate text. This is an illustration of the generator. It's similar to the encoder, but Note that the input is shifted right, so we basically look at the task to predict the current word. And instead of the multi-head attention, we are seeing the masked multi-head attention. In this last part, we're going to build a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. Similar to previous models, we're going to build upon existing architectures and just plug in the new stuff. If you have watched from the beginning to this point, I think you will be able to finish this part on your own. So I would advise you to stop watching and do that and go read the paper. Seriously, stop watching this. 
Okay, fine, whatever, let's move on. So the commonly used architectures for sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks is the encoder-decoder architectures, where the input sequence will be fed into the encoder. The output of the encoder will be the input to the decoder, and decoder will generate the output sequence. You might ask, can we just use a sequence generator's model for the task too? The answer is yes. For example, we can concatenate the input and the output sequence into a single sequence and use it to train a sequence generator. At inference time, we can input the first half of the sequence and let the generator finish the whole sequence. That way, the second half is the output we want. So a sequence generator kind of model will also work. But I think uh, at that time, the state of the art is the encoder-decoder kind of architectures. So for now, let's just stick with it. Let's say the example input is Nam loves dogs. The encoder part of our model will be the sequence encoder that we have built in part 3. It returns a sequence of output features. Then we will use the sequence generator described in part 4 to generate the output. Let's say the output is dog loves nam2 and we generate one word at a time. For example, we generate the word dog and loves and then uh, we output the words nam, nest and then 2. For this to play the job of the decoder, it also need to use the output of the sequence encoder. So we need to modify our sequence generator to take two inputs and fuse them. The first one is the current sequence that we are generating, and the second one is the sequence of features from the encoder. The second input will be injected by a special attention layer. This special attention layer will be a modified version of the query key value attention mechanism. Let's say our input is a set of three items i1, i2, i3. We then compute the value v1, v2, v3, and the keys k1, k2, k3. The change is that now we have the second input, let's say it's two items, x1 and x2. And we will use them to compute the values and the keys instead. So now we have v1, v2, and the key k1, k2. The queries are still computed using the first input i1, i2, and i3. For example, q1 will be matched with k1 and k2 to compute the v11 and the v12. And then we perform weighted average to output o1. And similarly for o2 and o3. So we can see that the output is actually weighted average of the second input, in this case the x1 and x2, their features are effectively injected into the network. And that is all we've done. This is the illustration of the generator before and after the modification. In the second case, external features are flown into the network. Let's look at the whole encoder-decoder architectures again. You can see that this attention effectively outputs the weighted average feature of the input sentence. And this attention part below it is effectively output the weighted average features of the current generated output sentence. This layer right here sum two of them. So you can think of it as a sum pooling or some fusions of the two features. Hopefully you have a good high level understanding now. How to go read that paper?